awesome to have you back for what happens to be our 216th show of ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And we try to broaden our horizon of our most remote islands of Hawaii by taking you out into the world. And that not just spiritually, but also physically, if possible, if any possible. And if we could get the first slide up. And when I'm saying we, it's basically our uh, island's uh, conscious uh, treasure distilled around Bishop Museum historian, then uh, Ron Lindgren, um, leisure, legacy, and hospitality heaven expert who has created one of the most memorable tropical exotic places on our island that we and DeSoto treasures. And we have who we see here as the show quote at the top right, we have our exotic escapism experts, Zana, who uh, on behalf of us uh, went out into the place, into the part of the world, which she calls her home away from home in Portugal, where she went uh, just last week. So we're uh, concluding today our uh, comparison between the our Polynesian and our uh, Macaronesian uh, um, Hawaii's, uh, because the Macaronesian, as you see at the very top left, is comprised of these different islands here. And one of them is the island of Madeira, where we conclude today to uh, compare some very sort of eruptive versus, um, you know, um, yeah, leave it with that. <laughs> eruptive architecture versus disruptive, I was about to say. And uh, so today I'm speaking on behalf of all of us, and this is why I was taking uh, blanking a little bit because I'm just by myself because everyone else happens to not be able to be with us for several reasons. And the Soto, as you can see down there, this is his uh, up there. Erdbeben erschüttert Hawaii is his traditional um, weekly German lesson, and he did that well over the phone uh, yesterday. But he can't be with us because he's under painkillers who help him to overcome, uh, and the middle word in the sentence erschüttert means shattered. And that's what happened to his wrist, unfortunately, when he was uh, slipping on a, with Howard Wig with his Cole Green show and our state energy guy rightly so says, uh, white roofs are cool roofs, but green roofs are even cooler, literally and figuratively. And um, you might be about to be our 12,000th viewer, but people need also to not just watch us, but listen to us. And we've been keeping saying we need green roofs, green roofs, green roofs. And, you know, then people like the soda wouldn't uh, break their wrists anymore. So um, that being said, um, we have been having this uh, comparison going on and dialogue in a surreal way between these uh, islands uh, on the opposite ends of the world that, as we point out, share so many things. Also, their geological condition, which made them uh, basically talk to each other. And both uh, the volcano on the neighboring to Madeira Island, uh, Canarian Island of La Palma, was awakening and erupting, talking, uh, er erupting. And the disruptive part of it that I was blanking on is actually only how we people feel about it, the human mankind, because nature doesn't have a problem with uh, steaming off and blowing off every once in a while, just the impact on us makes it seem and feel problematic for us. And so uh, the week, uh, that week when that happened, uh, Kilauea was basically sympathetic and did the same. And now also it basically did the same as uh, being Ashutat, because in both places, the volcanoes were shaking and we had earthquakes. And you see this being pulled from uh, media, it was both uh, uh, October 11th, which is also, by the way, the birthday of my dear sister. So happy birthday, retrospectively, Cynthia again. But it was also the day when De Soto, unfortunately, a less uh, nice um, um, happening, also was um, again ashuttering his wrist. So um, let's go to the next slide and have our other missing or only spiritually with us person, um, uh, Ronald Lindgren. So he just, um, the always alerted guy, uh, just got a complimentary issue of the architecture record, which featured this story here, which is basically saying that the Brazilian government, as you can, as you can read, is selling off its architectural legacy. 
uh, which is very sad. Um, and so uh, one of the buildings, as you can see featured here, is by the architect who did the project we're going to conclude to talk about, which is uh, uh, Oscar Niemeyer. So sad, sad, sad. It seems all to be about the money, right, and the greediness. And there is the cover of the current October issue, and it gives two projects there, the Academy Museum in LA, that Ron being residing in uh, Long Beach as part of LA, was very excited about it's the Renzo Piano project, a rather unusual one that seems to be inspired by his former fellows of future system, Jan Kaplicki. And it's a project we've been also been talking about a lot, which is the National Gallery in Berlin by Mies van der Rohe that has been retrofitted so you don't see it and doesn't show, as it was his intention, his own fingerprints by uh, David Chipperfield. And the top right is a preview of uh, uh, that we will share the recent sort of in a weird way synchronized happenings to all of us. They're all in one way uh, or another gravitating around that aspect of greediness and commodifying and commercializing things. Uh, this is showing and will be all sharing is Holly Kalani that has recently been remodeled. And part of his dilemma is what we used to call so many shows ago, the terrorization of territorialization. So if you're excited about that, how that relates to not just us, because we think and we believe it unfortunately addresses an increasingly uh, large amount of people who are struggling uh, for shelter and dwelling. So until then, uh, we go to the next slide and uh, uh, conclude looking at the project here was just the Pestena Park Hotel as that paradise on the islands of Madeira. Um, I threw in that little picture show quote at the, well, it's not a quote yet because that will come up in the shows that we do. We probably next week switch things up and do another automotive architecture comparison because we've been sort of getting deeply into our disciplines so we need to get out of it to keep you excited. But this at the very top left, uh, Ron will point out as part of his dilemma um, came that he was put up in a, in a project that he had built that had been, unfortunately, as many of the other ones that we talk about, been altered to an unbearable level, but luckily not the poolscape. So this is a comparison between the two projects. Uh, the large picture there is actually a very kind of tropical, exotically uh, sculptured poolscape, outdoor scape. And behind that is where uh, the indoor party goes on. Now let's go to the next slide, which is actually uh, the one we concluded on last week that we wanted to look more into as we promised. So this is the bar. And DeSoto and I were, so this show is basically, you know, we all contributed to it and talked a lot about it. So I'm just delivering on behalf of all of us. And DeSoto and I were saying, you know, this isn't really like high end, top notch, uh, super expensive material. This seems like plywood and local plywood. And in a very sort of a nice and clever way, um, comprised and combined. And so let's go to the next slide, uh, which shows us another bar. This is sort of on the, on the other side of that sort of back room of the bar here. Again, we said we don't know exactly what's absolutely original on, uh, in the hotel, not everything. Obviously, the chairs that you can see there to the left might not be. They don't look Niemeyerish. But that very sort of mirrored counter there, this bar might actually be. Uh, next slide. What truly is, is this amazing detail here where from the main elevated level of the lobby and that sort of mirrored bar, you basically go down into that a big dining hall. And this is uh, what's aligning the ramp is this concrete edge with this sort of very, very interesting and, and sexy curvy, swoopy, curvy balustrade is, that we've been talking a lot about the nature of balustrades. This is certainly would not be too cold here. It's too low, uh, but it's for that reason, it's very loungy. So the furniture, as we will see in a couple of slides, is right up next to it. And it's just a beautiful uh, combination and, and, and collage of, um, as the Soto likes to like it as of raw materials. And here the wood is basically softening the harshness of the concrete and vice versa. And the steel is adding that sort of third kind of tripartite touch to it. Um, uh, our exotic escapism expert is there 
uh, debating and exchanging ideas about the very kind front desk guy because the hotel, as we said, was closed. So we got that special permission to be there and he was kind enough to show us particularly this area here. That next slide is then how it uh, opens up and unfolds to you with this sort of majestic ocean view here. These amazingly skinny, um, uh, you know, wood uh, window uh, system there, blurring the spaces between inside and out. And uh, you're curious probably what's, and you see some glimpsing through here, what's under these cloths here uh, to protect, and we will get to that next, get to the next slide. Here they still are uh, covered again, but you see the view in the other direction, which happens to the, be the east, and you see that um, as something that we have here too, because the, as we call them horizontal high rises, as we call the cruise ships, are docking here right in downtown or around downtown, and here they do around this hotel here. You got this pier, and this time, you know, because of COVID, um, uh, still lingering around. Uh, there were no cruises there, but usually you yeah, the cruise ships uh, docking there. Um, you see the hotel on the top picture. You almost don't see it, and that was the idea, to keep it low profile, literally and figuratively speaking, is this horizontal line in the middle of the picture and uh, these rather sort of you know, less, um, less sensitive, chunky ones to the left of it came later. So that was Niemeyer's sort of you know, idea and a strategy to keep it low profile and to interfere the least, to have his built environment to interfere the least possible with the equally to, uh, to our so beautiful um, natural environment. So uh, next slide. This is again, we try to pull, obey to the copyright policy to pull as little as possible from the web and having to get authorization. So this is one of the few exceptions because again, we were there when it wasn't open. So this one here is uh, basically from the web and showing how it is when it will reopen. And I believe it has reopened by now. I doubt, again, we still have social distancing. So this is the pre-pandemic condition where it's all packed to the max. But you see how um, you know, uh, lively it is. And you see the balustrade up there on the top left. And you see the chairs and you can lounge there and then hover over this area here. They even bring uh, you know, real nature in as through these trees. And uh, you see the, the furniture in, in action and in performance. And speaking of that gets us to the next slide where um, we see, um, once again, one more from the web, how it will look like and most likely looks like now again when it's reopened. And so uh, speaking furniture, and you also see how um, basically because it's elevated, the ground is elevated, you have this sort of infinity pool kind of impression that even though the pool is old school and doesn't have infinity technology or performance, but it feels like because again, the ground is elevated and you, you just see about the pier there, and you certainly would see the cruise ships as being tall, kind of sticking out of that one. And the top middle is a picture from uh, back then, again, showing how low profile the whole surroundings were, just you know, one or two story buildings, and the building then basically, again, although a bigger mass uh, you know, seems to want to float and hover over the ground. And speaking furniture and you know, affordability, uh, these are at the top right and the top left. Uh, the top right is actually, uh, Niemeyer had one daughter who designed this chair sort of for her dad. And you can see for what kind of steal of a price it goes for $31,000. And even a little bit more up to 50 is at the very top left. This is furniture that Oscar Niemeyer designed himself. So can you imagine all these furniture in there? Just do the math and imagine the value of so this must be really a, a high price, high end uh, hotel, right? And we, you know, its sibling is the Mauna Kea Beach Resort that we've done a couple of shows about, and we do the comparison. So certainly you would say this is five star as the Mauna Kea Beach Resort is. And uh, what was the rate again of the Mauna Kea Beach Resort? It was $1,150 per night, which our utmost expert, Ron, said will add another 500 to that for eating and dining because it's so remote, which this one here isn't. You could go and dine out in the city. This is right in the city. This is an urban hotel. 
So, uh, so, so what does it take to get there? How much do we need to pull out of our pocket? Let's go to the next slide and um, lift the blanket on that one. So yes, it is a five-star hotel, but no, it's not $1,150. Um, it is, and this is actually pulled from the hotel website. The, the rates change daily, but they never go above 100. So this is a fraction. This is a a, you know, a, a tenth of it or a twelfth of it. So this is a truly affordable. Can you imagine to reside in an Oscar Niemeyer design hotel for the price that you want even in the cheapest hotel in our wine paradise here won't even get, get a room anymore. So that makes us think, how is this possible, right? And that's probably up not just for many more shows of investigation, but also more inter interdisciplinary investigation of the tourist industry and the building industry and all these things coming together. The things we throw in there from, from Google is, I mean, get a chuckle out of the, the, the bottom right one, which says understated hotel with dining, right? Isn't that a nice way to call an Oscar Niemeyer project? And in the middle is his most favorite uh, of all times project that he's mostly known for is that he had the chance to design an entire new city from scratch, the city of Brasilia. And these are pieces. And some say the chapel in there, which is the centerpiece for Mark Daly, it has some sort of similarity to the casino we're talking about, right? So uh, talking, how is this possible? Certainly there has to be a, a societal, a, um, a, um, you know, a, a social context and so I'll uh, get to the next slide. Uh, many uh, call, or some call actually Niemeyer a socialist the least, or a word that I'm not even to say. And some few decades ago, I would have been arrested right away in the McCarthy era for even saying the term communist. And uh, Niemeyer was indeed up in age, and he turned 104. And up in his 90s, he was actually the leader of the Communist Party in Brazil for a couple of years. But um, you know, early uh, when he basically escaped uh, the totalitarian regime in Brazil when that moved in, and he moved to Paris, in which years he designed this project here, um, he uh, basically then, a uh, month after that, uh, uh, got the job to design what you see at the very top left, which is the Ministry of Defense. And critics were saying, how can you do this? How can you dance with a devil that you just fled from and escaped from? And, and, you know, when you look it up, the rumors say that he, the very clever way, and he was a super clever guy, he convinced the, the main uh, military guy um, uh, to basically say, well, would we rather fight with, uh, with old fashioned weapons or with new ones? And that's how he was able to convince him to uh, design in his very sort of modern way. Um, Ron Lindgren is currently in uh, oral history with Anne Modonaga, and we will make this public at some point. It's very fascinating to hear your stories, Ron, around the military. So we're, we will keep picking your, picking your brain about that. Well, this is a preview of our ongoing automobile architecture shows there. Our cells, which you see at the very bottom left, um, have um, experience with that same client type and with the same having trying to sneak modernism and democracy in with that military diner we did. And also we, uh, after a long debate with our monograph author, Chris Van Uffelen, we uh, named our monograph Inclusive Architecture. So again, that's how uh, this quote from the press here, Oscar Niemeyer, man of the people, and it really depends on you know, how you look at sort of his uh, for the people architecture, depending on which kind of context you find yourself in yourself. As they say here, was he communist? The answer depends on where you are, literally and figuratively speaking. Um, so next slide for um, many uh, of us, including us, as you can see here and me, Niemeyer is a great hero that uh, we look up to from its detailing of brass uh, door handles through curvy, wavy facades to at the very bottom, beton bru. Um, we are with him. And so um, at the very bottom middle, I want to thank the director of the hotel that was so kind to let us in and to show us around. And who also uh, at the very uh, top middle 
again, gave me these uh, wonderful books uh, written by this architectural professor that many of the information for the show comes from. So thank you all for doing that. And talking um, at the uh, sort of bottom right, uh, thinking about uh, tropical brutalism, uh, this um, reminded um, me of the kindergarten we bit and that we've been looking into Le Corbusier in both his sort of um, domino house and mono house case studies he had going on. And that gets us to the next slide. And this is what uh, another consultant to the show, Tropic here, Rockwood, and uh, Canistacon basically said, well, this is very much about like Le Corbusier and Neymar instead in, indeed basically uh, you know credits Le Corbusier as one of his, his his big heroes and here you can see at the very left you can see at the very top the sketch is the mono house that he described as the female architecture that's under the cloudy skies and who knows on what a trip he was when he was doing the gender uh, comparisons but we know he didn't have a problem with that from the previous show when he was saying why you know curves inspire him and then there was the domino house at the very bottom that he described as the male architecture um, under the sunny sky and the villa savoie in, in in france is the best example for that for the mono houses there's some weekend retreat houses that he built as well you can see that this hotel here seems to be as we discussed almost a hybridization of the two um while um, obviously, it is very sort of stratosphered and, and sort of, you know, hovering above the ground. So it's doing the piloti thing and freeing the building from having to be load bearing. That's one of the five points of architecture that was his uh, philosophy. And so he was, the hotel is doing that on its sort of plinth level, on its ground floor level where it's hovered. But above it, it's almost an elevated mono house that very stereotomic, uh, kind of heavy and brisolate, by the way, uh, shading itself structure. So it seems a very interesting, again, combination of, of the two. So uh, next slide is, um, is this situation. We're under it here, you know, Miss EEE, and it's hovering above us. And she basically said, wow, because at that time, Primitiva 3 was going up. And she said, that almost seems a, like a rendering by Kendall Leonard and crew um, who, let's go to the next slide, were the team of Primitiva 3, in which we go back again to the nature of nakedness as we call it, and we keep discussing it. And uh, the exhibit that uh, Bandit Kanistakon is putting together, uh, um, the poster in progress at the very bottom right, is basically talking about that to rewild architecture more and make us sensitive that we are in the tropics where we need, don't need to uh, protect ourselves from frostbites. Um, our exotic escapism expert Suzanne reports uh, temperatures now plunging below the freezing point and the first snow coming into her place. So we know what we're talking about. We don't have this here. We don't also have the heat that I came from before I came here in the desert of Arizona. So we should dwell upon that and not just have the building to be more undressed, but also then having the people to be more undressed within. And that gets us to the next slide, um, which is uh, showing us uh, Primitiva, uh, uh, three on the right, then two in the middle, and one on the left. And it's this evolution. You can literally and figuratively see that the Primitivas in their thinking process basically are unstripping themselves uh, to the same degree gets us to the uh, last and fi final slide here, um, which is what does this actually all have to do with Hawaii? Can you find traces of all of that? Yes, you can. You just got to open your eyes and actually all your senses. This is us when we were um, here uh, about a month ago with our expert, Suzanne, and we went out on a morning stroll that ended up to take the whole first half of the day and we were getting hungry and try to play, find a place to grab a bite to eat. And we were basically not let in because of our bare chestedness. And finally, the place that welcomed us, warmly welcomed us was Haya, which is on Cujillo Avenue, which is run, guess by whom? By people from Brazil. So there you go. The Brazilians are maybe the more tropical, exotically erotic 
uh, nature people. So we have them here on the island. Let's look into them and let's learn from each other. Also, the very uh, top right images are some that Bundet has been pulling up as to uh, give the exhibit a more interdisciplinary touch. And he had these people from Portugal playing music in front of Diamond Head. And you have this uh, artist here um, with this installation that he basically called Tropicalia. So there are traces of the more uh, erotic, uh, tropical, exotic, even on this island. We just got to pay more attention to it and learn from more, more from it. So um, with that, I, we leave it with this. Uh, next week, again, we might switch things up, as I already said, and throw in another automobile um, architecture, mobile and immobile show, just to get our minds outside of the tightness of our discipline that we seem to get stuck in so easily. And hopefully for that, uh, we will have our panel back. So uh, Ron and this particular DeSoto, please get uh, better. Uh, till then, again, um, as we're wrapping up the comparison, uh, continue to adopt that sort of more tropical exotic, both uh, Macaronesian and Polynesian mindset. See you next week. Bye-bye.